Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Jeanette Griselli Brown, and I've been a member of the City Club for many years. I'm a past president of the City Club Forum Foundation. In my professional career, I was a chemist at the Standard Oil Company, and I'm also past chair of the board at the Great Lakes Science Center, which is why I'm so excited to introduce our speaker to you today, Dr. Kirsten Ellenbogen, an internationally recognized science educator and president of the Great Lakes Science Center as part of our Local Heroes series sponsored by Dominion. If you know Kirsten Ellenbogen, it won't surprise you that she is here not to discuss what makes the Science Center so wonderful. And as a member of the board, I know all about that without saying. <laughs> Instead, she is here to discuss workforce development. Now, I know that phrase, workforce development, might make some of you find your eyes glazing over, but let me say a thing or two about why this matters. Ask any employer in town, particularly in advanced manufacturing and the sciences, if they have ready access to the human resources they need to expand or even just sustain operations, the answer you often get is no. Last year, the Wall Street Journal reported that roughly a third of small business owners and CEOs reported they had unfilled openings because they couldn't find qualified applicants. It's not just a small business problem. McKinsey Global reports that by 2020, there will be a shortage up to 40 million college graduates for high-skilled jobs around the world. And this pattern is repeated throughout the economy, certainly here in Northeast Ohio. The problem with phrases like workforce development is that it, it sort of makes it seem like someone else's job. Kirsten Ellenbogen doesn't think so. Dr. Ellenbogen came to Cleveland in March of 2013 to head up the Great Lakes Science Center. She began her career at the Detroit Science Center and arrived here after working at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Since coming to Cleveland, she's been working on the Lakefront Advisory Commission, the Group Plan Commission, the boards of the Cleveland Water Alliance and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Even I'm inspired by her dedication to civic causes. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kirsten Ellenbogen. Well, I'm leading a large urban science center, and it is my dream job. And it's not because I can walk through our exhibit galleries and see people smiling and having fun while they learn. And it's not my dream job because I get to sit down with some Play-Doh and LEDs and batteries and call it a productive day at the office. <laughs> Leading an urban science center is my dream job because I believe that science centers are a critical part of an educational ecosystem. This educational ecosystem is largely invisible right now but it is our most powerful mechanism for nurturing the talent in our urban core and creating a stronger workforce in our city. So this belief that I am part of an ecosystem that can change our city is what gets me out of bed in the morning. And by the time I'm done talking today, I hope to have convinced you that taking an ecosystem view of our community will not only change your understanding of the Science Center, it will excite you about a few easy things you too can do to develop a stronger workforce. Now, I was not planning on spending a lot of time on our workforce crisis. Jenny has already given an introduction to that. And this concern has been so public, and we have so many great researchers and organizations working on this to bring workforce issues to light in Cleveland. But for those of you who have not been impressed with this work and immersed in it, let me share even more of a few other compelling statistics. By 2020, the United States will have 1.4 million computer science jobs with only 400,000 computer scientists to fill them. And these are estimates according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. In 2013, here in Cleveland, 
Cleveland State told us that there were 11,204 openings for computer and information technology workers in Greater Cleveland, but only 1,301 people here had received credentials in that field in 2012. So I can cite similar data about many other fields, but across the workforce, we know we have a serious skills gap. Here in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, there is great work that deserves attention and scaling up with our career academies, our bridge programs, cluster development, and other workforce success stories. But to truly be transformative, and I will argue to truly grow the talents of Cleveland's youth, we need to reframe our understanding of education as an ecosystem. Now, what do I mean by an educational ecosystem? Well, this is not something that's centered around one particular kind of organization. I've studied families over the course of about 18 months, and I asked them to invite me to join them anytime they were spending time together learning as a family. It's an unusual request, you can imagine. Many families did not last through the study, um, but a number of them stayed with the study through the full 18 months. And I went with these families to science museums, to art museums. I watched educational television with them. I sat with them as their older children helped their younger children do their homework. There were school events. There was time with family at the dinner table, evening walks in the park, and at the church for youth group meetings. One family even had me come with them to the barber shop. Apparently, the father gathered up all the boys every other month, brought them to the local barber shop, and this was a big time that they always spent talking together as a family with the neighbors, with the barber. And what I saw was a truly large range of resources and organizations in the community that these families used, that they manipulated to be useful for them as a family. And not surprisingly, I saw clear evidence that it wasn't just the family's children who were learning. So when you put the learner at the center, instead of schools or any one particular organization, you put the learner in that center and you follow the learner, you start to see extraordinary evidence of a lifetime of learning. So not to state the obvious, but childhood and the amount of time spent in school is brief compared to a person's lifetime of learning. So if you think about it, take about 16 waking hours in a day, and then look across the lifespan. Kindergarten through 12th grade takes up less than 20% of your waking hours during those years. Now this is not to say that schools are not critical and very important formative pieces of our educational ecosystem. I would say, frankly, that it's all the more impressive that schools can achieve so much in a relatively short amount of time. And schools are responding to this data, in fact, by lengthening the school day, lengthening the school year. But even with those lengthened hours, this is a vivid illustration of the fact that education is neither a practice nor a responsibility that is limited to schools. So when you look across the entire lifespan, still looking just at waking hours, you find that formal education accounts for only about 5% of a person's time. There is an abundance of time you spend in other pursuits in other places. So when you start looking at the time people spend learning and the places they learn, the educational ecosystem starts to become more visible. And it doesn't actually look like a pipeline, which is the typical metaphor we use in workforce development. Now, of course, you have to include schools, pre-K through 12th grade, higher education, including community college and the universities we have here. There are also STEM-rich institutions like the Science Center, like our zoo, our botanic garden, our natural history museum, our public television, our public radio. Another category is all the out-of-time school environments that we have here. So our Boys and Girls Club, the Y, our after-school programs at our housing authority, the community centers, the youth groups, scouting, all of these are part of the educational eco ecosystem. One other part that is too often overlooked are the businesses that make up our community. They're active in mentoring, apprenticeships, training, and perhaps even running youth education programs of their own. 
So what you start to see when you step back and follow the learner is actually a winding pathway, not a pipeline, that takes learners in and around and back again to these organizations. And a pathway, when you think of it that way, it starts to indicate many more possible entry points and many exit points. It fits the data that we hear about our youngest generation in the workforce, spending an average of only three years in a job and having three different careers over a lifetime. Pipelines, in contrast, tend to be most successful when they bridge shorter gaps. A pipeline is a relatively short-term fix. We have put a number of these pipeline solutions into place here with success. We have great community colleges, universities, technical retraining programs, and internships. But all of these provide solutions within a, about a five, at best, 10-year time frame. Now, these are important, and they make great improvements in our workforce. But think about the challenge of educating our youth for jobs that they will be in 20 years from now. These are jobs that don't exist today. Or if they do, they will exist 20 years from now in a different form. Add to that research that says that they will be in three different careers over their lifetime, and suddenly a singular linear pipeline to success seems to hold far less potential than an ecosystem that has many pathways of opportunities. So I'm hoping that you're starting to get intrigued at the concept of an ecosystem across many organizations, following the learner, and taking pathways, not a pipeline. But I'd also like to impress you with the powerful consequences and changes that happen when you view workforce development through an ecosystem lens. Now there's been a great deal of education research on the impact of ecosystems, and the word ecosystem has become a very common phrase when you look in the education research journals or when you look at reports from the National Academy of Sciences. But instead of some of that research, I'd like to give you an example from my own mother's story. She grew up on the west side of Cleveland on West 29th Street, the center of an area now called Hingetown. And when she talks about her formative years that led her to a career of working in IT, which is an unusual thing for a woman of her age, an age I will not be revealing. <laughs> she talks all the time about her school here in Cleveland, her high school called Lords. It doesn't exist now, but it was an extremely formative part of her schooling. She's dedicated to the memory of that school, and she credits it with a great amount of her inspiration of going into a STEM career. The thing is, my mom also talks about all these other things. She tells me about Berta Mae Blackburn, and Berta was the librarian at the Fulton Road Public Library that she went to all the time as a child. And Berta Mae Blackburn is the person who introduced her to science fiction, which has always been a big part of her inspiration and imagination that got her into a career like IT back in the 50s. She also talks about her neighbor, who introduced her to an amazing summer job at Standard Oil. Uh, and that interconnected pathway of experiences, not just her school experience, but also the experiences at the library, the experiences with her neighbor, the experience in her summer job, all of those come together when she talks about how a first-generation college student like herself got interested in science and technology in the 1950s. So when you think about addressing the skills gap through an ecosystem, the value of all of these different organizations that make up the ecosystem start to really change in a significant way. Now in education, we talk a lot about problem solving and problem-based learning. We have all these phrases, these important concepts that we think about in education. But when you take an ecosystem approach, one of the things that happens that is critical and so necessary is a, an alignment. And this alignment uh, comes out for us at the Science Center when we started to talk more and more, not just among ourselves with educators about problem solving and problem-based learning, but when we talk to our partners at corporations like Parker, at Lincoln Electric, these are the kinds of organizations that tell us, as you heard in the introduction, that there are hundreds of unfilled jobs here in Cleveland. These organizations say that what they need are people who can work with ill-defined problems. 
They need people who can work on problem identification and problem formation. Problem solving, they say, they have plenty of people who can do that. If you lay out exactly what the <coughs> problem is and give them the tools, they have plenty of people who can solve those problems. That's not why the jobs are going unfilled. And this was a wake-up call for the Science Center. It's been a big part of what we've been doing with our Cleveland Creates initiative. And it's a shift that we've now made in our educational programs to make sure we're integrating in these ill-formed problems, this idea of problem identification. And th we're doing this because we've stopped thinking about ourselves as an education institution that works on its own. We think about ourselves as part of an ecosystem and we value the alignment that comes with that. Another impact of approaching workforce development through ecosystem lens is inclusion. And when you look at the research on the mismatch between the skills that the employers want and the skills that job seekers have, the greatest gap is in our urban core. And in Cleveland, the children of our city should be our strength. Cleveland should be able to outpace Silicon Valley, where only 13% of STEM degrees are held by, by Latino or African American workers. And only one of every 14 Silicon Valley workers is African American or Latino American. An educational ecosystem highlights many more points of access and many more ways to succeed. Now this is critical. Jonathan Hollifield talks about this as the bad math of workforce development. We cannot succeed if 20% of our population in the United States is contributing less than 2% of our product. We know that in our large urban areas, we see the greatest numbers of business startups, high growth companies, R&D, and other indicators of innovation, like patents. Yet African American and Latino Americans who grow up and live in these large urban areas are not participating in, contributing to, or benefiting from these innovations. At the Science Center, we gather all of the seventh graders from across Cleveland Metro Schools to participate in an engineering program that is part of Cleveland Creates. And when they come to the Science Center, which is just one part of this program, they actually take this pile of stuff and they work with it until they can turn it into a battery. And when I watch these seventh graders, I'm reminded of Cleveland's history of great African American innovators like Garrett Morgan, who invented what you would now call a gas mask, who invented what we would now call a traffic signal. And I know that the next Steve Jobs will not be a white man in a black turtleneck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so taking this ecosystem approach is key to nurturing the genius in our urban core. I want to get to my promised list of things that you, that everybody can do, to play a role in workforce development. But I want to point out that I would be hesitant to give this same talk in other cities because ecosystems require a lot of coordination. They require transparency, trust, and an ability to set aside organizational differences and agree upon some common goals. And in Cleveland, I'm very confident that I am in the right place to talk about this concept. And I have been, in fact, since my very first days here when I was interviewing for the position of president of the Science Center. During one of these interviews, I was asked the question, why Cleveland? Why do you want to move here? Why do you want to move your family here? And I stared out the window and I said, as you do in these situations, when you need a moment to think of an answer, I said, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I looked out the windows, and these interviews were held off-site uh, from the Science Center. I look out the window and what I see are the guardians of traffic on the bridge that my mother knew as the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. And this is the route that she always took to get downtown. And it's the source of all these stories, Lorraine Avenue, right? Her stories about the movie theater, the diners, all of this revolves around this street in her stories about her childhood. And add to that the fact that I can't look at the guardians of traffic which, without thinking about how much I love bridges and how much I love anything that is Art Deco. And for someone like me who grew up in Detroit, having these huge heroic statues cradling cars, well, that just says home to me. <laughs> 
So I've been asked this question now many times. In fact, I was asked it just this week when I was meeting some new people. They say, why Cleveland? I don't need to stare out the window anymore when I answer this question. Now when I'm asked why I'm here, I always talk about the people of Cleveland. I talk about the people, in fact, that I met when I first came here for those interviews. The cab driver who went on for 20 minutes about all of the complex financing that went into making the Flats East Bank a reality. And what a triumph it was for the entire city to finally see the shovels going to the ground. I talk about my waitress, who I talked to when I was interviewing here. She explained to me how the Cleveland schools were going through this transformation plan. And she told me about how she was thinking about sending her child back to the public schools. And when I think about those people that I met in my first days in Cleveland, I knew that this was the right city. And I know that it's the right city, the ideal city to coordinate an educational ecosystem in a way that transforms our workforce development. I know that efforts that succeed in Cleveland succeed because the people of Cleveland are all in. And it's not just about our basketball. This city is going to support and has been supporting the transformation plan for schools, supporting and stepping up this wraparound schools effort. These efforts already are taking an ecosystem approach. And the approach highlights some of the things that all of us can do on a small scale to leverage big change across this ecosystem. So the first thing I want to recommend is that you think about yourself as someone who can help the young children in your life think about careers. And, and I mean young. I don't mean college students. I don't mean high school students. It's critical that we start young. Do not wait until high school. And these questions are simple questions. They're questions like, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And if you have never met David Boone, who is a graduate of MC Squared, our <coughs> Cleveland Metro School that's at the Science Center, we have the ninth grade, our partners at GE have the 10th grade, and CSU has the 11th and 12th grade. Those students are extraordinary students. And David was one of the earliest classes. Uh, he's famous for the headline of From Homeless to Harvard, and was featured in many articles here in our city. Uh, and unfortunately, David's story is not unique. Uh, at least 10% of our youth in Cleveland Metro schools are homeless at some point. And so David found himself in that situation. And when he talks about how he got out of that and how he got through MC Squared, graduated, and went on to engineering at Harvard, one of the people that he talks about that surprised me, some of them didn't surprise me, right? His, his mother, his neighbors, his principal, all of those I expected. What I didn't expect is he always tells the story about his school nurse. And what he says is that his school nurse back in elementary school sat him down and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she pushed him. And she said, you need to have an answer to that. You need to have an idea. And that was the first time he really started to think, OK, I like science. I like making things. Maybe I like engineering. And that led him to MC squared. So, Ask this question. It is a powerful transformation for many, many youth in our life. The part about not waiting for high school is so important. The identity formation that happens when you ask that question of a youth turns out to be more predictive than any other factor in whether or not they're going to end up in a science, technology, engineering, or math career. So asking that question of a child, if they say around sixth or seventh grade that they're interested in a STEM career, that turns out to be three times more predictive than most of the other factors, like whether or not their parents are in a STEM career, the household income, how many AP classes they take. It's an extraordinary study, a longitudinal study that gave us that kind of data. It's now been replicated. And it's an indicator that we are starting too late. We need to start younger, helping our youth think about careers. Second thing you can do is make the education educational ecosystem more visible. The tendency in workforce development has been to create clusters, to try some top-down mechanisms where we build technology parks in the United States. We mix in R&D. We mix in universities. We provide incentives to attract innovative workforce. We establish favorable business regulations. And these things have some successes. But they were originally designed as a way of how answering this question of, 
How do you create the next Silicon Valley? And this, if you build it, they will come approach has faced many difficulties. And we have not seen transformative new Silicon Valleys popping up all around the nation. Now the opposite approach, though, doesn't get you much further, right? The kind of completely grounds up hacker spaces, launch houses, these are powerful, but again, there's something that's in between this, and it's this ecosystem approach of taking some of the top-down things that have been created, integrating in some of the bottom-up pieces, and recognizing all of it as this loosely knit ecosystem. It requires every organization, and I mean the organizations that you work at, the organizations that you lead, the organizations that you volunteer at, requires each of those organizations to share respect for the different roles that all of these organizations in the education ecosystem bring to the work. It requires us to value transparency, and it requires us to share information and data. We do have that in Cleveland, but much of it has been going on in a vacuum. At the Science Center, we recently worked with about 40 different organizations from around Northeast Ohio as part of our Cleveland Creates initiative to actually map out activities going on around Northeast Ohio that would fit the category of the maker movement. Now, what do I mean by the maker movement? This is the kind of the child you see that takes an old record turntable and turns it into an automatic cat feeder. It's what President Obama, <laughs> it's pretty cool, I've seen it. It's what President Obama has talked about is moving us from a nation of consumers into a nation of producers. And it's going on here in Northeast Ohio <coughs> in a huge way. Uh, and we were able to find 40 different organizations willing to come to the table. And we mapped out our assets, all of the different activities that we partake in around this maker movement. Now, in all honesty, it was an awkward process at times, uh, but it worked. And simply sharing all of our activities, literally putting them up on a wall and saying, we do this with these age groups, here's when we do it, here's how we do it, here's who we serve, putting those on a wall was transformational for that group. And the group has continued. Uh, and in fact, just this past month, we had our first collaborative activity. Um, we have a maker fair that's been going on in Northeast Ohio for a number of years now. But we also organized in recognition of the National Week of Making, an hour of making, where all of us made sure that last Saturday from 2 to 3 PM, we all had maker activities going on. And we launched a map so that you could track where these things were. And what it did is it made this ecosystem visible. The third thing we can all do is ask for more alignment. And this alignment is critical because when you start looking at things, you start to see that there are all sorts of areas of mutually exclusive development. And education and workforce development are only two of those areas. There's extraordinary work going on in workforce development. There's extraordinary work going on in education. And sometimes they're going to go like this unless we ask for more alignment. So connecting the dots, being a connector in the community, making sure that the old divisions, this concept of, well, that's science, that's English, some of those don't even hold up. When you interview the companies and say, what are the skills you need? And they talk about being able to do a critical analysis. Well, is that language arts or is that science? Yes, right? It's both. This is what's happening more and more. So our old divisions of subject matter, our old divisions of you work with this audience, we work with that audience, those things start to fall apart when you look at the skills that we need for the jobs of the next decades. We did find, for example, when we brought together those 40 organizations around the maker movement, um, that some of us really valued connections to advanced manufacturing, some of us focused on the arts and creativity, and others were more focused on education. So we put all those together in a Venn diagram and said, OK, there's got to be some commonality here. And we worked through it until we actually found that there were a common core of skills that we all valued. We all valued creativity. We all valued problem identification. And it turns out the goals that unite us are far more important than the goals that differentiate us. So please take this list of things and treat it as a call to action. This is, we have a need to mobilize the invisible infrastructure of our education ecosystem. Real impact will not happen through sheer numbers. It will not happen through lockstep uniformity. But it will happen through a coordination of our differentiated activities 
in a mutually reinforcing way. Thank you. Today we are enjoying a Friday forum featuring Dr. Kirsten Ellenbogen, president of the Great Lakes Science Center. We encourage you to organize your questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9, WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Radio and television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. In observance of Independence Day, there will be no forum on Friday, July 3rd. So be sure to join us on Thursday, July 16th for a conversation with Dustin Heisler, Chief Information Officer of eRepublic on human behavior and disruptive technologies. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's forum is part of the Local Heroes series sponsored by a generous grant from Dominion we thank you for your support. Today's forum is also the George Gund Forum on the State of the American Economy, made possible by generous, a de generous endowment gift from the George Gund Foundation. We thank you for your support. We welcome guests at tables hosted by the Cleveland Zoological Society, the Great Lakes Science Center, and Joanne Clark and Sally Stewart. We thank you all for your support. Now it's time to return to Dr. Ellen Boggan for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today, our Director of Programming, Stephanie Jensky, there you are, and City Club intern, Wesley Allen. First question, please. Doctor, this question has to do with the role of government and in a very narrow sense. Recently, we heard a report uh, about the policy of the Disney Company at its parks and what some would call the abuse of the H-1B visa pro program, where it's being used extensively not to bring in scientists, but to, frankly, just hire cheaper help. Uh, do you have any suggestions as to some changes in that program that might make it more effective? Uh, honestly, I think in Cleveland we have some terrific organizations. I always look to Joy Roller for questions on this. Uh, I know that if we are going to strengthen workforce, one of the ways to grow Cleveland and to grow the terrific work going on here um, is to make sure that we're bringing in the wealth of resources that we have as an international world, um, not just locally. And, and this is a difficult question because as you point out, uh, these visas can be misused. Um, they can be used in a way to take advantage of people. Um, and honestly, most of these programs, the more we have programs like the ones we have here in Cleveland, where there is a system and a structure around to support people coming into the community, I think the safer it will be for those coming in and the more attention to proper use of the regulation. Hello, that was a great, uh, great presentation and we thank you for inviting us to be involved. Um, I know that you, or at least I hear that you have a very strong interest, as does the zoo, in evaluating STEM programming. Um, I in, I'm interested in your ecosystem education approach and do you have a vision for how we would measure the impact that that has on our community? Yeah, so this is a great question around evaluation of the ecosystem. And the first thing that happens when you talk about ecosystem-related evaluation is that you have to have shared measures. And so I spend a lot of time talking about shared measures. And those are difficult because it means that, again, you have to get people to come together and agree on some shared goals. 
we have a grant at the Science Center now with our partners at Kent State, as well as uh, IdeaStream, and it's an international grant, so we have partners at the Irish Independent and University of Limerick on this. And we're looking at how do you evaluate learning around science, technology, engineering, and math across a newspaper, public television and radio, and the Science Center. It turns out it's difficult. <laughs> but those are being worked on more and more. And in fact, you can see resources online where there's a real effort to get some of the measurement tools up there. Um, one that's coming up a lot is Gil Gnome's work uh, that is, um, and I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but it, it is uh, coming out of Harvard and it's, it's not just the work being done there, but what it is is a compendium and a collection. And if you look at informalscience.org and search under evaluation tools, you'll see that it links you to a whole series of these sites where people are starting to come together and say, we are going to have some of these common measures. In all honesty, pretty soon we may not be able to choose to do this. Um, the Department of Education and the National Science Foundation recently uh, signed a joint agreement that includes language around common measures, and I expect we'll start to see this more and more for those of us who get federal funding. Great talk, Kristen. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 you brought up the concept that schools are focusing on standardized testing and basically learning information and that nonprofits are looking at the, the ability to identify a problem, identify, you know, not just how to solve it, but how to identify it. So my question is, we know that a number of organizations in Northeast Ohio are taking on that, that task of that informal science education. What's the critical mass that's needed in order to be truly impactful both here and in other organizations, is it, is it just the science centers or do other organizations have to jump on board with this ecosystem concept to get us to where we need to be? Thank you, Chris. So um, I didn't talk about standardized testing, in fact. Um, and, and one of the exciting things about <laughs> Cleveland, <laughs> maybe I should have. Uh, one of the exciting things about Cleveland, in fact, I would argue is that we have so many schools <laughs> who are not strictly teaching to the test, who are understanding that there are many, many ways to provide terrific educational experiences for our youth. We have blended classrooms, um, blended learning schools in Cleveland. Um, we, we have so many different efforts and mechanisms being tested out and put into place. Uh, so I have to start by saying, I think actually the school system we're dealing with is one that is accepting challenges and looking at making changes in an extraordinary way. Now that said, as I said, you, you cannot rely on just schools to be your only source of education. They were never designed to be that way uh, and they shouldn't function that way. We should not ask them to do that. And so it means that we have to wrap around them, that we have to coordinate with them. And I would certainly say that there are far more organizations already involved in this than just the Science Center. So a terrific example is work that we're doing um, and, and in all honesty, the Science Center was one of the late organizations to join it because it was a group that started focusing around environmental education and natural sciences for Cleveland schools around the mantra of place-based education and Cleveland Zoo, Natural History Museum, our Botanic Garden, our Arboretum, um, our, who am I forgetting, the Aquarium, a terrific range of organizations have been participating in that for a number of years. And the Science Center came in recently to that and said, okay, we'll take an older grade, so we're working with seventh grade, and we'll move us more into engineering. And one of the things we've been doing from that is creating these maps and saying that, okay, there are all these organizations that can help the younger grades, and they can do these wonderful things around environmental science and natural history, which are a key part of the core curriculum at that time. Who else is going to step up and make sure that we cover the older grades, make sure we get in the engineering, get in the technology, and those sorts of things? And actually, we're starting a conversation at the Science Center about all of these small nonprofits that focus on technology education. So her ideas in motion, Black Girls Code, Girls Can Code, um, the, the work that uh, is a spinoff from what Lev Gonick is doing with One Community. There are an extraordinary number of nonprofits in town who are working around this technology education. So what you'll start to see very quickly are not only all of the organizations that you would typically call informal science education, like the zoo, the aquarium, the natural history, science center, 
but then also these small nonprofits that are springing up all make up part of this ecosystem and we're going to have to leverage all of them in order to make this work. Dr. Ellen Buggin, you mentioned that uh, we should ask kids at a fairly young age what they want to be when they grow up. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that to some extent is it leaves many of us 70 years later still trying to figure that out. <laughs> Which leads to the point that a lot of us do end up with a lot of different careers and a lot of changes during our life. So both in the educational ecosystem at the beginning of life and throughout life, how do we best prepare people for those changes and to be mo most open? For all, I know in our lifetimes we've seen tremendous amounts of change and it's probably going to accelerate. How do we prepare kids and adults for that? So uh, one of the interesting things is you start to see that the focus becomes less on specific disciplinary perspectives and more on these skills. There's a big debate going on right now as to what we call these. Some people call them soft skills. Some people unfortunately call them non-cognitive skills. Um, there's, there's a whole range. And respected people, but we're struggling to find a name for this because there is this change happening, right? The idea of being able to have information at your fingertips when you need it, yet not knowing how to use it, how to find it, how to work from that into something that the careers of the future will really need, it, that is shifting a lot of things for us and raising many questions about how we're preparing our youth for the jobs of tomorrow. So that's why you start to th say things like critical thinking, the ability to analyze text, the ability to ask good questions, as we do here at the City Club, uh, the ability to really say, that's not the problem, actually the problem is this, right? Some of our greatest innovators are famous for doing that. That kind of skill set, and I'll call it for now the soft skills, for lack of a better name, as the debate rages on as to what to call them, those are what we're going to focus on. And what you'll start to see is even a blending across disciplines, because those things do happen in math class. They happen in what you would have called science class. They happen in what you would have called English class, right? And we will start to see, and we do see this already in degree programs like the International Baccalaureate Program that's happening in more and more of our schools, where these skills are across curriculum areas, and those are the skills that are important, not the content areas that you and I grew up with. Hi, that was a very good talk. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, you talked a little bit about the nonprofits that participate in this ecosystem. And I know one of the things that we are concerned about here um, and pretty much around the country is funding. You know, how do we continue to support the members of this ecosystem who help to generate and, and perpetuate these children and young people out into these places? And I know that funders are worried about capacity, right? So. How are you going to exist? And we've been having conversations about employers and government taking up stance in these ecosystems and creating this synergy for the funding to remove the reliance so much on individual funders and foundations. So have you given much thought to that? And can you talk about that? Sure. So that's an issue near and dear to my heart <laughs> as someone who leads a nonprofit like the Science Center. And it's something that we all struggle with because on the one hand, we're so grateful for the funding, and on the other hand, everyone in the room knows that we can't continue to rely on funding coming in every year for the same thing over and over again. And, and you understand that demand, right? We want to see new things being created. We want to see new audiences being reached. So how do you do that and continue to serve the people you were serving in the first place? Well, in Cleveland, I think we have some terrific collaborations going on, and I'm excited to say uh, that just uh, two weeks ago, another collaboration happening national just became public, and I suspect that we're going to see more and more of this. There is uh, a group that's been getting together, and they've been calling themselves the STEM Funders Network. And it's made up of um, private foundations like the Noyce Foundation, Samueli, Moore, organizations like that. And they've been coming together on a very casual basis for the last few years, and very quietly. There was uh, no website, no official existence of a 501c3 that brought them together. And uh, they've been very quiet about their existence. But for the first time, they said, you know what, we're going to step up. And the first thing they said that they were going to step up and fund was ecosystems, was to say what they want to get away from, right? And this is 
um, more than 20 national organizations that fund STEM education. They want to get away from the one by one by one by one grants and move into something where what they fund are backbone organizations, the concept of having a strong ecosystem, the process of coming together around common goals, and that by funding that, they believe that they will get stronger returns, that people will figure out a way to make sure that we're supporting each other, make sure that the learner is the center focal point for all of us across our organizations, and make sure that we're able to go on and always multiply the impact of any funding that we receive. So we're starting to see some of those things come together, and I have to tell you, if I, as I've gone around to some people in the community to say, listen, Cleveland got this phone call, there's this interesting new funding network come into place. Um, some jaws have dropped because some of these organizations most definitely never spoke in the past. Uh, so that's an exciting change, and it's one that I suspect we'll see a great deal more frequently now. The concept of this ecosystem is absolutely amazing and fascinating. And the partners that you have mentioned that are coming together to date are those that one would expect. But my question is about what is the involvement of the private sector? Because it seems like the private sector becomes the other part of this, learning and then private sector being the practical application of that learning. So has the private sector already gotten involved? And if not, what are the strategies to integrate them into the ecosystem? It's a great question. Um, I'd say at the Science Center, we have the good fortune of an extraordinary board who's made sure that the private sector that they represent is part of this conversation. And it led to some of these moments, these aha moments of talking with organizations like Lincoln Electric or Parker and saying, oh, oh, you, you mean we're not quite aiming for the same thing that you're aiming for, and how will we make that adjustment? Um, we find that when we bring together the maker groups, that small manufacturers are quick to come to the table. Some of the small startup companies, they're eager to get in there and have this conversation. But I would say that there are plenty of, com of organizations who have been invited to the table repeatedly, private organizations, who are not showing up. And, and so we do need to do more. Uh, some of it, I suspect, will be showing that by bringing all of our smaller organizations together, we start to have quite a presence. And that may either attract or frighten people enough to join the conversation. And I'll take either one. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it is an issue. I, I will say I've been impressed by so many organizations. You know, we said as part of our Cleveland Create Strategic Initiative that we were going to bring all the advanced manufacturers together and drive this conversation only to find the conversation was already happening. And there were terrific conversations across many of these advanced manufacturing companies, Precision Metal Form Associations coming in again next week to talk with us and really sit down and say, all of these many organizations we represent are having the same conversation you are, so let's get that together. So there are rays of sunshine, many rays of sunshine, um, but I agree that the private organizations have been last to the table, and we will need to keep that call to action going, and I hope you're helping with that. Dr. Ellen Bogan, I was struck by your dis description of your mother's experience. And I want to tell you partly why. I live near West 29th Street. And I also was the first tenant in the building at May Dugan Multi Service Center, which replaced Lord's Academy wow. in 1976. Um, and I remember Lord's Academy, probably not from the time of your mother's uh, being attending there, but from the 60s and early 70s. Um, my, your remarks struck me as uh, giving me flashbacks on a couple of things. One is, what you're really describing in some ways is the need for a liberal arts education with science at the center maybe, if that's the local, st STEM's sort of taken over that uh, area of discussion in some ways, but what you're really talking about is problem solving and uh, identifying problems and ways to adjust to new circumstances using science as a basis partly. The second thing I was struck by is when you talked about your maker's activity, I heard a report this morning on National Public Radio about Cleveland having the, oh, the next uh, garage activity to create the Wright Brothers experiment, and it sounded like the maker's activity that you just described. But it also came across as, why would that be happening in Cleveland? And we both know, I mean, it was, it was sort of based on this issue of 
manufacturing's dead. I thought the, the image of the report was manufacturing's dead. We know it's not dead in, the, in Northeast Ohio, and you've had an experience in other parts of the Midwest where it's not dead. Um, how do we change that discussion so that people begin to understand that creativity and making things is still alive and well and needs to be alive and well in our country? Yeah, it's a tough question. We talk to our friends at Magnet about this all the time because they have that catchphrase that resonates so strongly with us at the Science Center about no mother wants her daughter to grow up to be a machinist, right? And, and, and I understand that, um, but I also now, the more time I spend out with advanced manufacturers, it is not the assembly line that I grew up with in Detroit. I mean, as a child, uh, we used to go on field trips to the Rouge River plant, um, which is probably Detroit's most historically famous plant where raw materials came in off the Detroit River on one end and out the other end came a car. And it was an extraordinary feat of mankind to be able to build like that. And we would tour that as a kid and people would shout to us from the line over to, because on the tour you were pretty far back, stay in school, don't get a job like this, right? This is, this is, this is what I grew up with and this was my image of the automotive plant of manufacturing in America. So now I go out to places like ATD. Uh, I go out and I see that it's a clean workplace. I see that it's a safe workplace. I see that it's a workplace where people work on one project for six months, maybe a year, and then they have to actually reprogram, redesign, and completely transform the plant that they're working in and the machines that they're working with in order to create the next <coughs> set of materials that they'll be creating, right? And that's a very different, creative, um, innovative, engaging kind of atmosphere uh, that I wasn't expecting when I set foot there. So there's a lot to be done around that. Um, part of it is making sure, now we have a National Manufacturing Day, right? And that's a surprise to people because they say, well, wait a minute, I thought manufacturing was dead. And we call it advanced manufacturing, right? to draw a line and say, actually, it looks very different now from what it used to, and it is alive and well here. We have the National, uh, NAMI, the National Association for Additive Manufacturing here in Northeast Ohio. That's a big deal, right? Additive manufacturing, which is this kind of 3D printing. You can come to Cleveland Public Library, use, your, use a library card, get access to a 3D printer. We have it set up in our maker open houses on Sundays. And come in, use a 3D printer. Once you get good at that, you can go over to Tech Central, not at the library, sorry, over at Case um, at, to Thinkbox, and they have 3D printers and equipment there. You can build a car, right? So we have these, <laughs> I'm not kidding actually, <laughs> they have these extraordinary opportunities all around Cleveland. And part of what will help is making sure that people connect this crazy little 3D printer with the concept of manufacturing. Right? There's a gap that exists between the advances in that field and the public perception. It's something that the Science Center feels very strongly about. Uh, we have more than 330,000 people coming through our doors every year, and we are a very easy way to get the word out to the community and say, this is not your father's manufacturing plant. It looks very different. So we take that seriously, and we work very closely with our partners at other organizations to make sure that there's a common voice across this. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, so my question is around globalized learning, and I wonder where you see language learning fitting into this ecosystem of education. I think we all know that we're very far behind in the United States in terms of learning languages, and to be globally competitive and to be successful as a well-rounded human being, I think we all need to strive to learn languages and learn about other cultures and places around the world. So I wonder how you see that fitting into your uh, ecosystem. Sure, so the neurologist in me is going to come out now, which I don't use that often. Um, <laughs> but but if, if you ever want to talk about the treatment of multiple sclerosis and working in neuroimmunology, I'm there for you. Um, but but this, this brings to mind, I do keep up uh, with the latest research, and one of the things that we're finding in, in neurological research is that there's a, a great deal more opportunity to learn more at a later age than we had ever expected. But some of that depends on making sure that the pruning that prunes away some of the neuronal pathways at a younger age, that that doesn't get pruned away. And so a lot of the theory behind 
teaching languages like Japanese and Chinese to very young children, right? Pre-K, kindergarten. And the goal of that most of the time is not to make sure that they're able to speak those languages fluently. It's to make sure that they can hear those tones and that those neuronal pathways get activated and used so that they don't get pruned out, right? I would say that the same thing is going to start to happen around STEM education, around language learning. All of those have this common goal of making sure that we develop a flexibility, right? So think about coding. That's just another language. Mm -hmm. Understanding the principles, the patterns of algorithmic thinking at a very young age to make sure that those neuronal pathways aren't pruned away can go a long way to making sure that when you're on your third career, in your 40s, in your 50s, that you can actually go back to that and learn some of the skills involved in that. So I'd say there's always a place for language learning. It might be, in fact, much broader than we originally expected. And it's nicely connected into STEM education. Today at, the, today at the City Club, we have been enjoying a Friday forum featuring Dr. Kirsten Ellenbogen, President of the Great Lakes Science Center. Thank you, Dr. Ellenbogen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. <laughs>